I just press the let's go live button, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the interwebs. Before we go ahead and get started, got to make sure those tubes are working. And it looks like they are on YouTube, on Locals, on Rumble, on Telegram, on X. It's working! That means we can go ahead and get started, so let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about Jack Smith. That guy again, yeah. He is fighting to keep a bunch of information under seal. We're talking about the Florida classified documents case. We have a little bit of an update here, not a long filing, but there's this back and forth, this battle over names of FBI agents and names of people who executed the search warrant at Mar-a-Lago and all this stuff that Trump and his defense say should be a part of the public record as a presumption because we have access to records, especially in a case like this, where they're prosecuting the former president and the current leading candidate for the president again. And so Jack submitted this in Cannon's courtroom opposing more unsealing. And this is a battle that we've been covering here back and forth. And these names must be very, very important. They are fighting very hard to keep these names under lock and key. So we're going to go through this filing and see what Jack Smith says inside before we mosey around the media and see what else these people are talking about when it comes to Trump. Because Nancy Pelosi and Kamala are now talking this new meme that Trump is Putin again. We're like, ah, oh, gosh, again? We've already seen this season before. They already did Trump is Putin in 2016. That was season one. Then we had season two. They brought back the Russian threat in 2020 for season two of Trump is Putin again. And now for season three, they're gonna do it again, saying that Trump is a dictator. And what's curious about this is, you know, they're saying that you know, Putin is like this major communist who's like this totalitarian monster. And it's weird because a lot of the same stuff that's going on over there, like the imprisoning of his political opponents, they're trying to do right now. And in fact, one of their dictatorial attacks is from Judge Ariola Angeron, who then hit Trump with a $500 million, give or take, rounding penalty. Trump posted on Truth saying that this is cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment, and we'll see if that stands. It, it absolutely is. Jonathan Turley came out. He was explaining that, yeah, a bond is probably going to be needed to be posted. We'll see if he can reduce that bond amount. But either way, Trump's coming out of pocket millions of dollars. He's going to get hit with that. And Alina Abba, we played a little bit of this clip yesterday, but there's a broader interview. And so she gave us some more details about what they intend to do in Angeron's situation. And so we'll see what's going on there, kind of see what's happening with Jack Smith and then bounce around the media and talk about what else is happening. We've also got a bit of an update on Fanny, Fanny Willis down in Georgia. Now she showed up in a church over the weekend again, and she was telling the congregation to please pray for me. She got some sort of award and they're really circling the wagons to protect her. I mean, they are bringing out the big guns. They got all these church people, you know, now, uh, I guess, praying for Fanny. That I guess maybe she doesn't sleep with another married man again. Maybe they're praying for that. Uh, don't sleep with a married man. Lord, please help her not do that. You know, so we'll see. Now, she says that she needs some prayers and, su and support. I've also got a couple interesting stories. One from local council. This one is fresh out of the oven. And this one is from, I think, a, a not... A not Trump fan, okay, an anti-Trumper is saying this case might be really problematic. And this guy is actually someone who practices in Georgia. He's a criminal defense attorney in Georgia. I know what I thought about what Fulton County DA's office did. I, we watched their performance and across and so on. But this guy is a defense attorney who's like in there every day. I'm in Arizona. I'm far away from Georgia. What I sh saw was shocking and disgusting, but we'll see what a local attorney has to say about it. There's also a little bit of follow-up on that Fannie campaign cash saga. Remember, she said she took a bunch of cash out of her cash. She made a donation in cash to the campaign, and then some of that cash apparently came back out. And we had questions about this. 
well, you know, is there a process? I've never run for office and I'm wondering, I think there was paperwork, you know, there's a lot of paperwork, FEC and file this and taxes and just, you know, all the things. So did she follow the cash that apparently she gave herself and then regave herself? You know, she gave to the campaign and then regave herself. Someone did some digging into that and we'll see what they say. But also my friends, she's getting support from the mayor. Okay, so this mayor from Atlanta, his name is Andre, he's out supporting Fannie. And apparently we didn't know this because we're not really familiar with local politics there, but apparently he showed up when she was testifying. He actually walked into court and sat down, right? The mayor of Atlanta. And so circling the wagons, media, of course, is covering for Fannie. They're like, it was a great hearing. What are you talking about? Like we, we saw her, she seemed passionate. So what are you talking about? Don't be racist, don't be racist, okay? Fanny's incredible. So we'll see what the mayor says. He, you know, he's out throwing his, uh, his weight behind Fanny. And this is another former DeKalb County prosecutor who just says, you know, there's just not enough there. And so we'll go through it all. We'll get an update on Fanny and see what's happening. We're still waiting for the judge to schedule the summation, the closing arguments for that evidentiary hearing any day now. It might come out this Friday. We'll see. We've also got some updates. Now, Julian Assange, my friends, we have not talked about this case in a long time. We have had it marked on our calendar since it went into warrant status in 2019. And you can see on May 23rd, they issued an arrest warrant for this guy. He's been overseas. He's been held in the UK court for quite some time, but they had a proceeding here today. You know him as the purveyor of WikiLeaks, a doc, uh, uh, an entity that received documents, classified documents, and then shared them with America and the rest of the world so we can all see how disgusting our government can be. And so he has now been under lock and key for quite some time, but now he had a hearing in the UK. We're going to see if we can piece together what happened because he's on warrant status, right? If the UK says, here you go, US, he's coming back over here. They're going to quash the warrant. The case is going to pick right back up. He'll be prosecuted for his various espionage charges. And so we're waiting to see what happens, right? Is he coming back or not? There was a crowd outside the court in the UK. You can see this is Julian's wife. Her name is Stella. She was outside explaining what's going on. Of course, our CIA has been involved in this all over the place. Mike Pompeo, <laughs> apparently, right? Uh, under the Trump administration, apparently wanted to go kill this dude. And so Stella is talking about that. We'll see what happened in the UK court proceedings. We're going across the pond today. We're going to uh, you know, we're going to put on some hats like that and we're going to go hang out with our friends in UK. I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone in UK looks like that. Is that right? I'm, I think so. I think so. We have a couple members from uh, the UK. I think they wear that when they go to bed. I think I've never been. I don't know. So RFK also explains that there should be some efforts to free Julian Assange. And he is joined by a bunch of Congress people and the Congress people are bipartisan. We see, we see people from a, <laughs> someone says, no, we don't wear hats like that. Oh, okay. Are you sure? I'm not sure about that. We, so we have a, a letter from Congress to Joe Biden. Say, see, confirmed. UK says from the, yeah, confirmed. Okay. I knew it. I knew it. All right. So they sent a letter to Joe Biden saying something needs to be done about this. Right. And I totally agree. Hopefully there is justice for Julian. We're going to cover what happened there today and dig into it. And so my friends, as you can see, we've got some good stuff to unpack today, a little bit lighter on some of the heavy filings. We got through a lot of that yesterday. We're waiting on, you know, SCOTUS rulings. We're waiting on some more substantive stuff, but we had a lot to get to today. This morning, we had a great conversation on our members only streams. We do streams in the morning. So if you love this show, you're even going to love the morning show even more. And so come check it out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We talk about all, all, all the other stuff that we can't get to here. We talked about Biden and his uh, demented brain. We talked about Trump, the election, 2024 stuff is really where we cover a lot of that. So come and join us, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning. We do streams on Saturday and we do an after party. As soon as we're done with the show here, we go back and debrief. If you want any PDFs or if you want to sign up for our email newsletter, great place to do that, robertgovea.com. All of our PDFs are uploaded over there. You can access the mind map and everything we're about to go through and sign up for our newsletter so all of our show segments get delivered right to your inbox. And this week at watcherlodge.com, which is where we have our events, 
We have two free events coming up this week and next week. We'd love to see you join us. They're on Zoom, but you got to go register. On Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to have a food sovereignty workshop. My friend Mike Voltz is going to come and chat with us. He's awesome. Very smart guy. And so if you're like, I probably should get some food in the event of, uh, you know, the, the world melting down, come and join us. We're going to have a great conversation about it. Watcherlodge.com. It's free. Go sign up, register for it, add it to your calendar, and then we'll see you there over on Thursday, Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And then next week, political Zen wellness with my friend Jason Campbell. So that's on Thursday next week, one week after. And that is also free. Watcherlodge.com. Come and join us. We're doing some fun stuff. Okay. Now, my friends, without any further ado, let's get into business and see what's happening in Florida. Jack Smith continues to fight to seal key witness names from evidence. He does not want Donald Trump's defense to be able to disclose some of the discovery in the case because he says, if we know the names of the people who raided his sock drawer at Mar-a-Lago, it's going to be dangerous to them. You know, that this is the same broken record that we've heard from prosecutors and all the prosecutions. Trump is dangerous and anything that he does to defend himself is going to enable dangerousness. It's going to be a threat to American democracy and so on. So Jack submitted this in Judge Cannon's courtroom. That's interesting because he says, he actually gives us some insight into what we're fighting over. He talks about FBI agent names and witnesses and actually unveils a little bit more about the type of materials we're talking about. But then we've got reaction about what's going on with Trump from the usuals. And we're going to see what Trump said about this, about his penalties and the Constitution under the Eighth Amendment. But here is what Jack Smith sent back into Judge Cannon in the Florida case. Not a long one, it's a five pager, but the case is United States of America, Jack Smith, Joe Biden, and the rest of the deranged thugs versus Donald Trump. Of course, this is taking place, West Palm Beach Division in Florida, Judge Eileen Cannon's courtroom presiding. And a lot of the people on the left are saying that Judge Cannon needs to go because she's inclined to find in favor of Trump on these issues in favor of the presumption of access to the material. You know, this is a pretty important case we're talking about here. If Jack Smith thinks he's got the evidence, well, he can present it. He doesn't need to keep it all under seal all the time. We want to see it so we can evaluate ourselves. He doesn't want that to happen. He wants it all to be done ex parte and under seal, so we cannot see it. So here is what he's saying in response. Trump is actively trying to unseal all of this so we can see it. And he says, Jack, we respond to Trump's motion. He asked for leave to disclose discovery. Okay, Trump asked for permission to be able to share some of this with America. They say Trump's motion is inconsistent with their own process. And it is a, a request that should be denied because if we allow this stuff to be unsealed, Jack Smith says, it would unnecessarily expose potential witnesses to very real dangers of harassment and intimidation and reprisal. Whoa. Okay, so if Trump is allowed to talk about the evidence in his case, witnesses are going to die. Here's what Jack says. On January 16th, Donald Trump filed their motion to compel discovery. We've read this a lot. Uh, all motions to compel and responses, the replies, all of them, right? We really covered that one at length. And then they're saying, we want additional permission to file a, another brief. Now, two days later, and consistent with your order, Judge Cannon, says Jack, the government responded to the motion for temporary leave, and we opposed it to the limited extent that the motion to compel from Trump or its exhibits identify prospective government witnesses. Don't name our witnesses. And some of this material constitutes Jenks Act material, which are notes and memos that the witnesses might use. So you've got the witnesses and the notes or memos that they might use. Or it might contain certain additional and discreet sensitive information. So we can't see any of it. Then on February 2nd, Jack filed a motion to file sealed and redacted documents in connection with its unclassified response in response to the motion to compel. And then the court came out and granted some of Trump's motion for leave to file the redacted brief. Now, Cannon also granted Trump's request for unsealing. 
And this is why they're flipped out. Oh no, they're gonna get to know as to the names of potential government witnesses and their statements. And Judge Cannon, you did that based on your conclusion, the court, that the government failed to carry the quote, heavy burden of showing that the ceiling was necessitated by a compelling government interest and that it's narrowly tailored to serve that interest. Okay, so there's a lot here. Remember, in these prior motions to compel, Trump said that everybody in the government was involved in the case. We talk about the hula hoop, but who's a part of the government's team on the prosecution? Is it just Jack Smith and like his three bros, like Jay Bratt and Molly, the highlighter girl? Is it just those three bros and a couple of FBI agents? Or is it much broader than that? Does it in fact include the Secret Service, other agencies of the DOJ that were working on this before the indictment ever came down? How about the House Homeland Security Division? How about the CIA, okay? White House Counsel. All of these other people were a part of this. And so Trump said, we need you know, NARA, the National Archives. We need all of those entities to be compelled to provide us with this material. And Jack Smith said, we can't do that because first of all, they're not a part of the team. And the stuff that we can talk about, he says it needs to be under seal. Now we have this balancing test, right? When stuff is a constitutional right, like free speech or right to access to see certain things, can you impinge upon that? How can the government do that? They have to really meet a high standard. And that's what we see here. It needs to be necessary. So in other words, if Jack is going to, to silence our right of access, the presumption of access, it's got to be a good reason for it. A compelling government interest that is narrowly tailored. Jack Smith just responds to all this stuff and he says regularly, witness safety, democracy, blah, blah, blah. That's not enough, okay? You can't just pull out the democracy card every time you want the government to crap all over a constitutional right. Democracy. Uh, no, they do that, but that's not how it works, not in Cannon's courtroom at least. So this is the standard. She says, you didn't meet it. On February 7th, Cannon then issued an order ruling on the government's motion for permission to file other sealed and redacted documents. And they directed the government to comply with the redaction instructions from an earlier order. Now, then on February 8th, we're getting closer in time, the government filed a motion for reconsideration. Jack Smith flipped out. What? You're going to unseal? Okay, this is uh, Cannon unsealed all that basically said, yeah, we're going to start to take a look at this stuff because you haven't demonstrated any reason to keep it sealed. All you do is say, my witness safety. And we're tired of hearing that. Come up with some concrete examples. So Jack Smith then responded. He is seeking a reconsideration. And we covered this one too. We heard from Jack. He says, please reverse yourself. The next day, on February 9th, the court issued a paperless order and directed Trump to respond to the motion for reconsideration. They said, can you please reverse yourself? And Trump responded, do you want me to reverse myself? And they stayed the deadlines and other orders pending the resolution of the motion for reconsideration. Then, on February 9th, Trump filed a notice about their forthcoming reply in support of their motion to compel. And they say that they propose to file that same day, all portions of the unclassified reply that do not reference the discovery. So we're gonna file stuff that we can talk about and it's not gonna reference the other more important stuff. And we're gonna seek the government's position about exhibits and other references to the discovery that they sought to include in their reply brief. Okay, so we're gonna work with the government. We're gonna figure out what we can talk about publicly on the public docket. The rest of this stuff will get you know, submitted under seal. They say Trump also indicated that once they received the government's position, they would either file a supplemental reply brief if Jack Smith does not object to the publication of these things and other reference material, or they want to seek leave of the court to file a redacted copy of their supplemental brief under seal. Now, later that day, Judge Cannon approved Trump's proposal. Now, that conferral process that was followed did not yield agreement on all redactions and sealing. So now, again, we have a conflict. I know this is kind of a lot of process. Okay, this happened, this happened, this happened. But this is, this is the point. With the classified documents in this classified documents case, there's a lot of this back and forth. Of course, they're not going to agree. Trump says unseal it all. They say seal it all. Now, yesterday, on February 15th, says Jack, and this one was filed 
on the 16th, says rather than simply seek leave to file a redacted copy of their supplemental brief, Trump took a different approach and they submitted another filing. So again, we're battling over all of this. Can we seal it? Can we unseal it? Now, what are we talking about? This is where it starts to get a little interesting because we get to see what they're saying. They say from Jack, okay, there are four categories, Canon, of discovery that Trump seeks leave to publicly disclose. This is what Trump wants to reveal to us. And the court should deny the request as to all of them. We're going to talk about each one of these in turn. First, they say Trump and these other defendants, they seek to publicly disclose the entirety of a search warrant application for Carlos de Oliveira's Gmail account, right? So government got a search warrant. We're not talking about the actual warrant that was executed. We're talking about the application. So the filings that went in to go get access to this. Carlos de Oliveira, somebody who works for Trump. So they get access to his whole Gmail. Now they say, as represented to the government in the conferral process, Trump's team said that there is a single paragraph of the search warrant application to go get that Gmail that is of interest to the defense for purposes of their reply supplement. So a single paragraph, they want it. Yeah, we want to see it. What's in it? Now the government says that Trump suggested that they file the pertinent page of the search warrant with redactions. So they say that one paragraph should be redacted and it should obscure the names of potential government witnesses. Now, again, like, let's be very careful here. They file the pertinent page with redactions to the paragraph. Okay. So they want the full paragraph, but why can't we just have the witnesses? Hmm. So for example, like you might have a piece of paper that looks like this and you might have a bunch of sent paragraph sentences, right? That form a paragraph. That's a paragraph, right? In my little uh, drawing. Now, if you redact this whole paragraph, you might be overbroad. Okay. The name might be right here. So if the name is FBI agent Loserville, well, we just redact agent Loserville right here. Okay. And you just, oh, Agent Loserville again. You just get rid of Loserville. Agent Loserville. Just get rid of that one. Okay, so we redact just the names. We don't redact the whole paragraph. Okay, this is what, what I'm reading Jack Smith is saying. We want to redact all this, you know, so we can protect and save the names from, you know, from being identified. No, no, no. Just redact the names. You don't need the whole paragraph. I think that's what they're saying. But instead, as was true with several of the exhibits that they attached in support of their motion to compel, the defendants have gratuitously sought to publicize the entire search warrant application, despite their asserted extremely narrow evidentiary need for it. Well, we want to read what's in the paragraph. What is it? Detailing similar defense efforts. They say there is no reason to permit them to do so and thereby jeopardize the safety of our potential government witnesses. Just redact the name. Give us the rest of the paragraph. Now, second, the defendant, Trump, they seek to reference and to quote grand jury testimony for two potential government witnesses. Who are these FBI agents? This one is an FBI special agent. Oh, and a secret service agent. So these two guys came into the grand jury and they testified. They said, here's what I found. I'm agent Loserville. This is what I discovered with, you know, secret service agent. And they got it all on the record in the grand jury. They went and testified behind closed doors. So they seek to reference and to quote, they're filing motions, motions to compel, motions to suppress all the things. And they say, we want to reference them. Okay. They said something in the grand jury that obviously is not true. It's inaccurate. It's not relevant. It's, uh, you know, unethical. It's biased. It's a con, whatever. I don't know, but they want to reference and they want to quote it. And it's two agents, FBI and secret service. Now in their motion, they do not specify whether they intend to attach the entirety of those transcripts as public exhibits, which I sure hope so, because we can't generally get access to those things, right? Grand jury testimony is usually sealed and like sealed hard. So you can't get it. But 
here, right, they're saying we're, we have it and we want to attach it. We're asking for permission. Let us see it because the grand jury testimony is what brings the charges in the first place. And so if you're filing a motion to you know, dismiss the case, you want to undermine that. So they say, okay, here's what Trump wants. Okay, they don't want the names going out. Here's what Trump wants. He wants, we don't know what they want to do with this, but there's testimony in there from Secret Service and FBI. So in the conferral process, which we talked about, they go back and forth, do you agree or not? With respect to the grand jury transcript for the FBI agent, the defendants indicated that they were interested in a single page, but that page contains almost no testimony from the witness. Hmm. And instead, right, so he, he's talk, he talks for a long time, but the one page that they want is instead largely colloquy between prosecutors and members of the grand jury. Isn't that curious? So in other, you know, colloquy is just not meaningful talk, right? It's just a prosecutor kind of going through, ladies and gentlemen, you know why you're here today. We have to do justice in America. And being on a jury is one of the most important civic duties a person can have. And where we hear him here, all the things, right? So it's just, a, a, you know, whatever they do. And the prosecutors go in through and they say, nope, that's the page that we want. Right there. Give us that. And they say, well, it's not even related to anything. There's almost no testimony even there at all. Now, those excerpts, they say, should remain the subject of the protective order. They do not want us to see it. Because who knows what the prosecutor was saying? Probably something that is a problem for their case. So prosecutors, you know, ran, you know having that conversation probably with the FBI agent, you know, FBI, ugh, kind of meaningless stuff. They don't want that to come out. So that should be protected and protected under the rules. Don't let us see that. Now, with respect to the transcript, this is Jack Smith talking, with the Secret Service agent, also in the conferral process, Trump's team, they said, we want five pages of Secret Service testimony from the grand jury. Now, those five pages, they include numerous references by name to prospective government witnesses, and they should remain under seal as grand jury material is protected by the rules. And it is, like, it's, you really can't get it. I mean, the defense can get it, but public can't. And also to protect the witnesses whose names appear. Now, if you need to talk about that stuff and write in a motion to dismiss or something like that, you just go and get permission to do it. And that's, what we're, that's where we're at. So Jack apparently, again, I think is making the same distinction. So for example, right, again, we talked about how Jack wants it to be overbroad. He wants the whole page to be redacted. He does not just want the names to be redacted, right? So he's acting like we're just protecting witnesses, but he keeps talking about pages, right? He says here, there are government witnesses and they were, they're referred to by name. And so in substance, these pages discuss an email chain that itself should also remain sealed. The entire email chain should remain sealed. And so those five pages including the references by name should remain under seal. You see, he's talking about pages. He's not talking about names. If he just came out and said names and said, okay, look, like we're not going to put the name out there. I'd even say, all right, I'd be curious about the names, but I'd say that's a fair compromise. If the judge comes back out and says, you know, it says FBI agent so-and-so said this or secret service agent so-and-so said, you just redact the last name. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll be able to hear that at trial, but we at least want to see it. That's not what Jack is saying because they're dishonest. He wants the whole page, all five pages sealed. Hmm. But his basis for that is that it's witness safety. So again, Cannon should look at this and just go, okay, well, what's, what's the basis for the rest of the stuff? See what Jack says about that. And third, they say, Trump intends to refer to and to quote a U.S. Secret Service email chain. Hmm. Apparently that didn't get deleted like their text messages from J6. Isn't that curious? That they identified during the conferral process. The emails are paradigmatic Jenks Act material, which are like supplemental memos and reports for potential government witnesses. And as explained at length elsewhere, at this point, they should be kept from public view, not only to protect those witnesses, here it is again, 
from harassment and intimidation, but also to prevent exposing other potential witnesses to the information. So it's kind of like a witness sequestration argument. And fourth and finally, and again, you know, this is very broad, right? It's, it's, if you know about this, other witnesses will know about it. Okay. Well, there's a lot that, that, that happens all the time. Okay. We have a lot of stuff that witnesses know and hear about. And if you think that they're under, you know, attack or something like that, of course you can charge people with crimes, bring it to the court's attention. If a witness that you need to call, right? You can cross examine them. If you're concerned that they've been tainted by this information or whatever, that doesn't mean the public doesn't get to hear about all this. And fourth and finally, says Jack, the defendants intend to refer to, so Trump intends to refer to what they call, quote, a record that was produced by the U.S. Secret Service, which includes a floor plan of President Trump's residential area at Mar-a-Lago. So a record from the Secret Service that's a floor plan. But they say, you know, but this isn't just any record of a floor plan. Trump wants a memo that was prepared by the Secret Service personnel following a residential security survey back from April 2021. Yeah, probably meaning the whole place was pretty dang secure. A lot more secure than a garage at Joe Biden's residence. Now, it is labeled law enforcement sensitive for good reasons. It contains details of the Secret Service's security assessment of Mar-a-Lago, its vulnerabilities, and its requested upgrades. Ooh. Now, the floor plan to which Trump refers appears in a diagram on a single page of the 23-page document. Now, the government proposed that Trump include only the page with the diagram and redact the text below it. For obvious reasons, any publication of this document should be carefully tailored to avoid unnecessarily publicizing sensitive information about the survey. And the court should deny Trump's wholesale unredacted publication of it, which is such a joke, okay? Hey, if Trump wants to publish his floor plan of Mar-a-Lago, let him do it. I don't think he's too worried about people coming in, right? He's not a hysterical mental case like every other Democrat. He's like, well, I get death threats every day. Jenna Griswold's like, I can't even walk outside with someone saying hello to me in the morning. I'm under attack. They said, hello, relax. Okay. They said, good morning to you. Calm down. You're not under attack. Relax. Sheesh. Give me a break. So. If Trump wants to propose to to show us this, there's probably a pretty good reason for that because it's probably going to show that the, that the entire place was fortified out the wazoo, right? So there was no real national security threat is going to be their argument. Yeah. Here's the diagram. Okay. Here's where the documents were. Here's where we moved stuff from. This is why we were doing it. It's going to explain something. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. We care about Trump's security. Jack Smith is really worried that somebody's going to go and attack Trump. And so it's going to expose the vulnerabilities and we don't want Trump to be under attack, do we? All right. So that's from Jay Bratt, all right, one of the worst there in Florida. And he sent that one in and we're going to see what Judge Cannon does on this one. I cannot, I hope to see some documents, baby, because we want to see what's going on here. And we got a little bit of insight into what Jack is trying to cover up there in that short filing. But all this is having to do with classified documents. And remember, they tell us that Trump is using these classified documents to collude with Russia and to collude with terrorist groups. And he has secret war plans from Iran and all this garbage, right? Well, they're pulling that one out of their back pocket. The old Trump-Russia collusion meme is being recycled yet again. We already saw it in 2016, saw it again in 2020. They're pulling it out again. Trump, Russia, Putin. So here is Pelosi. Here's Kamala all talking about it. And it's weird because they're all celebrating simultaneously their own team that's acting like a maniacal dictator by prosecuting his political opponent through Jack Smith in two different locations, just like they do in, in Russia. And they're trying to remove him off the ballots, just like they do in Russia. Weird. All right. So here is this stupid meme from these people who I think are just out of talking points. They, you know, it's kind of like the re-ones that you see Speaker Pelosi. all over, you know, in the, in the TV and the news and, and the movie Hollywood. They're just out of new ideas. And Pelosi has been around for so long, she doesn't know what year it is anymore. 
And so she showed up on MSNBC's hit show, you know the name, with Jen. Here's what it sounded like. What do you think? We're all wondering this question, Speaker Pelosi. What do you think Putin has on him? I mean, it sure seems like something, as you've said a few times, given that he refuses to criticize him, that he seems to be a fanboy yeah. of him. That's a, that's a great question, Jen. It seems like there's something that Putin's doing. What is Putin doing, Nancy? Can you tell us? <laughs> are, are you worried well, at you all? Well, you know, uh, during the Mueller... Go ahead, Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. First of all, first of all, we must be sure that he does not step one foot into the White House, no. not as president or not as anything. He has brought disgrace to the White House, to these presidents. I talked about George Washington. It's also President's Week for uh, Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln died, it was embroidered in his coat that night at that theater, one country, one destiny. And he gave his life to unify our country. And now we have someone who had the honor of serving in the White House, didn't consider it an honor, didn't consider his oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution. And th on this week, speaking out the way he did about N Navalny shows you that he is a person without values. Yeah. He looks like he's going to be a person without dollars either, but the values ah, are what concern A person without dollars. Yeah, you're going to steal all of his money. It's wild. They're, they're talking about Putin, and then they just are excited that they're stealing Trump's money because Letitia James and Angeron hit him with a $500 million verdict. It's wild that they can't even recognize. They're very concerned about a communist state in Russia. And it's like, well, we got communists running our country all over the place. What are you talking about? Look what you guys are doing. You're trying to imprison him and remove him from the ballot, just like Putin. Us. Yes, the, the dollars. So I don't know what he has on him, but I think it's probably financial. I think it's probably financial, either something financial he has on him or something on the come. Okay, so Putin has a financial hold over Donald Trump. All right, we'll see how that unfolds. They've been saying that for a decade now. Good Lord, come up with some new talking points. Here's Kamala, okay, she got the meme too, and this one's pretty painful. We're gonna have to sit through it, unfortunately. But here, watch her face almost contort as she's trying to struggle to answer this question. And they're bringing her, I think, up to speed, wondering if she can maybe slot in once Joe Biden falls down the stairs again. Here's Kamala. I mean, the idea that the former president of the United States would say, that he, quote, encourages, encourages a brutal dictator to invade our allies and that the United States of America would simply stand by and watch. No previous United States president, regardless of their party, has bowed down to a Russian dictator before. And now we are seeing an example, of something I just believe that the American people would never support, which is a United States president, current or former, bowing down with those kinds of words and, a, and apparently an intention of conduct to a Russian dictator. Okay, Russian dictators are destroying, um, are gonna destroy America and Trump's gonna be in bed with them according to Kamala and Nancy. And they say that with a straight face as they are waging legal warfare I would say not even legal warfare, right? I think they're exploiting the rules in order to bring charges against him, exploiting their own rules, charging Trump with crimes that other people have not been charged with. Classified documents problems for Trump. No classified documents problems for Joe or for Pence or for Hillary. There's two systems of justice. You can burn down the third precinct in Minneapolis, watch it smolder into the ground. Kamala Harris will stand up there and support bail for you. If you're part of BLM, she loves it. No problem, torch the police, no, who cares? But if you're a J6er who gets tapped on the shoulder and invited to walk into the Capitol building by the cops, they'll throw you in the gulags. So Trump, of course, posted this on True Social and he's dead right. He said, the Eighth Amendment, let us not forget, says excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And of course, we have forgotten about that in this country because many people who are in control of the levers of power are using it to destroy their opponents and 
they don't think it's cruel. They don't think it's unusual. They think that this is how it should be when they are in control. Now, Jonathan Turley wrote a good piece on how this is going to unfold for Trump, saying that Trump might be even forced to sell off his property. Now, Lena Abba is going to come back and explain a little bit more about their position on this. But he says it's a lot of money, right? And that is true. We don't know what Trump's liquidity looks like. See a $400 million in cash sitting around? And talk about a judgment. No one lost $400 million of, of anything. It's just a penalty for Trump because they don't like that he's Trump. Now, while Trump has good grounds to object to this excessive fine, he still has to come up with close to half a billion dollars, says Turley, just to make his arguments in the Court of Appeals. Now, in order to file a, an appeal, the court requires a deposit for the full amount or a bond that covers the full amount. Even with some escrow options, the call for cash or collateral can be enough to put some executives in the fetal position. It's like, oh my gosh, 400 million, 500 million. It can be challenging enough for many companies drained from years of litigation. For Trump, 350 plus 100 million in interest could force a fire sale on his properties. We'll see what Alina says about that. Many of us have been critical about the ruling. There was an astronomical fine, despite finding that not a single victim lost a single dollar. In fact, they all made profits. Indeed, these banks testified they wanted to continue to work with Trump. We covered the trial here. They said Trump was a whale of a client. Now, putting aside the merits of the judgment, Turley says, the threshold deposit rule, you know, if you want to appeal, you got to post what you're owed so that they can hold that in bond while the appeal is pending. The unfairness of this law now would force Trump to lose millions. Now, even for Trump, even this fine would amount to only 14 to 17% of his total wealth, but the addition of the recent 83 million to E. Jean Carroll would also be another hit. Now, of course, we're gonna see what Trump does about all this. Trump could also secure a bond, right? So some other company could help him post this, but that guarantee would also come at a cost. Bond would require him to post 10% of that and he would lose that amount. So 45 million to have another company cover the $450 you know, million dollar bond. Trump can move to ask the trial court to allow him to proceed. That, however, is up to the courts. Are they gonna grant an exception on this? We don't know. Now, the expectation is that Trump can make the deposit or secure a bond to avoid what some call a fire sale on his properties, right? They're like, perfect. We're going to strip this dude's buildings away from him. That's how sick they are. This deposit is now being celebrated as an added indignity and a penalty. However, as New Yorkers cheer, many businesses are wondering, where the heck are we? What are we doing here? Manhattan's a total joke, as we know. And this is Letitia James trying to execute a public figure. And she's basically trying to do that. So they're sick, of course, but this is all they have left because they really don't have any ideas. They have sort of pathetic lives with no meaning or purpose. So they reorient themselves to just run against Trump. That's their whole purpose for existing. And of course, that's what Letitia James did. That's how she won there because New Yorkers, many of them apparently believe that way. But here's Alina Abba. We listened to a little bit of her in re reaction to this, but let's hear what else she says. Of course, that's Letitia James. And here is Alina reacting to all of this and the manifest injustice from Angeron. Haba joins us, attorney for former President Trump. Alina, good to have you with us. Uh, first, your reaction to the attorney general there. I'm glad you asked, Martha. Um, nobody is above the law. I would just like these left-winging DAs and AGs to show us that. Show us that. I'm inviting you to show me that no one is above the law while we have Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, and all of his friends up in D.C. in the deep state that have not been touched. Show me no one is above the law, Martha, because I'm not seeing that. Do you know what I'm seeing in court in these cases is that everyone is above the law if they're friends with Miss James, if they're friends with D.A. Bragg, and if they're friends with Fannie Willis and Jack Smith. The only person that is not, the only person who did nothing wrong but will still get persecuted and prosecuted is President Trump because they can't beat him in November. So I want to use their words against them and invite them to show me how no one is actually above the law, because there are, there are people that we know have broken laws, and we have not seen the system of justice be used the same for them as they are for President Trump. President Trump did nothing wrong. He's being persecuted. Show me the people that did real crime 
get persecuted well, and prosecuted. Some, so, I want to see that. So, some of those people uh, are back on the street in about five hours, um, and, and a lot of New Yorkers right. would like to see those people um, who are not rich or powerful, um, but who have some power in this city in terms of how safe people feel or don't feel. Let me ask you this. In terms of the 30-day deadline from Judge Angeron to pay this extraordinary fine that, jo that uh, Jonathan Turley calls obscene, um, is yeah. that the case? Does he really have 30 days to pay this fine? And if so, there are some reports that he will sell off almost all, if not all, of his New York assets. What can you tell us about that? No, I mean, I would never get into anything privileged, but I can tell you what the rules are. And within 30 days, even if we choose to appeal this, which we will, we have to post the bond, which is the full amount and some. Um, and uh, we will be prepared to do that. All right. So is, but how much is the bond? 450. It's going to be a lot. So that's where we picked up when we heard from Alina on a prior show. But she says that they are going to be appealing and they are prepared to post the bond. So we'll see what happens when that happens, what the appeal looks like as this all continues to unfold. We're covering all the Trump prosecutions. And so thanks for joining us as we do. Don't forget to check out some of the links down in the description below. We've got some great lodge events coming up this week and next food sovereignty workshop and political zen wellness all free events go to watcherlodge.com to sign up for those and we'll be back here talking about jack smith anger on and the rest of the media trying to putinize trump again and so we'll look forward to seeing you back here on the next one all right my friends now let's turn our attention over to georgia and we're going back down to talk about fanny Fannie Willis goes back to church and she's pleading for prayers. We're going to see what she says. We're also going to see that the mayor of Atlanta, this guy called Andre, is supporting her. So Fannie is circling the wagons, going to the congregation, getting love and adulation, getting prayers and having a lot of the local politicos support her. This comes after her testimony in Fulton County in the disqualification hearing. Now we have an article from local counsel, a local criminal defense attorney, who says this whole thing might have been so bad it might be fatal to the case. He's not a Trump fan. We're going to dig into that and get reaction to Fannie's campaign question on cash, whether she took cash out from the campaign, and we'll see what else is happening in the trial and whether this is going to be enough for disqualification. But here's what Fannie sounded like when she showed up into church. This one comes from Woke Preacher Clips on X. And here's what it sounded like when she showed up in court. Multiple camera angles. And here's Fanny after she went out and screamed at America. These are lies. Rah! Now she's in the house of God. Let me tell you something that I've learned very, very recently, because you may need this lesson as well. You know, and if you sleep with a married man and grift hundred uh, thousands of dollars for your lover off the taxpayers people keep sending me scriptures and I and I appreciate those scriptures but different people from all different walks of life keep sending me this one scripture and I don't think I ever really heard it till to maybe two days ago you people send you stuff you read them they just kind of become things you recite but you don't really think about what they say let's boost this volume a little bit we do not want to miss Fanny the scripture they keep sending me is, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Come on. I need y'all to hear me though. They did not say the weapon, weapons will not form. And that's the part I didn't hear until recently. Just because they won't prosper, it doesn't mean that they won't form. Even if you feel like everything you are doing in your life is the right thing. Except adultery and conflicts of interest and cheating the taxpayers and going on multiple cruises on their dime. Except for those things. And you're making mistakes all along the way, but you're trying. Those little ones I mentioned. You should not think that those weapons will not form. The other lesson that I've learned in this three years is God ordains those weapons. He puts those weapons in your life to form against you. And if you really understand him, 
you become in your maturity to understand he does it for a reason and it's to grow you and it's to make you stronger and it is to prepare you. And so my I'm, only- I'm doing this for you, Fulton County. We're here for you, right? I am going through this challenge. I'm gonna be stronger as a result of it. Yes, I slept with Nathan Wade. Yes, there was a conflict of interest. Yes, I got a financial benefit on this thing. Yes, I lied on my disclosure forms. I don't know what a gift means. Yes, Nathan Wade lied on his interrogatories because he doesn't know what marriage means. We all fibbed about that, lied about that in our affidavit. Then we got Terrence Bradley to lie. Then we destroyed him anyways, all this stuff, right? It's all causing apparently like demonic forces or something, right? To form as weapons to go and attack someone in the light. It's wild, right? Wild. And, and she's going in a church and, and it's almost like, it's not even, it's not a confessional, right? It's her, I think, rallying support. It's almost like a political speech in church. Request from this family today is, this is a really hard job I'm trying to do. I'm sure. And I am an- in I'm sure. How many times did you go on cruises in the last couple of months? How were cruise, multiple cruises, Belize, Napa Valley, and so on. It's really a lot. Imperfect human being, but I can literally feel the people who loves me's prayers. If just every now and again, you'll throw my name in a prayer, God hears his children. Pray for me. I would very much appreciate that. So I thank you for this honor today um, because it is an honor worth having when it comes from a group of people such as the people that worship here. So thank you. Okay, so her demeanor was a little bit different. She wasn't screaming at anybody about how they're all lies. And it feels a little uncomfortable to have somebody who was you know, doing what she was doing, come out there and then try to parlay that into some fight for glory. You know, she's now like, I think a, a weapon of Jesus, you know, she's like, yes, now I'm under attack, but it's going to make, but it's not legitimate. And now I'm going to be stronger as a result of it. Like I am a weapon of the faith or something very uncomfortable, but all right, that's what they're doing over there in Fulton County. And she is circling up, right? Going and getting support. And it's all about Fanny, right? So, sorry for, for grifting a million dollars to give to my lover. Sorry about that. Sorry that I might have totally wrecked what they think is a very important case in Fulton County, which is gonna be the Trump prosecution. Sorry that my, uh, my infidelities may have contributed to the downfall of a marriage, you know, who knows. But she says she's under attack and she needs your love and prayers. All right, maybe, maybe Georgians will give it to her, some of them in that, in that building. But here is what a local defense attorney had to say about this. This is an opinion piece over from the Hill. And while we're looking at these amazing looking shoes, pretty good, huh? But here is what the story says. They tell us that the Georgia case, this is from a local Georgia defense attorney. His name is Andrew Fleischman. He says the case against Trump, it may be fatally compromise. Whoa. Here's what he said, just to be sure. He says, in the interest of full disclosure, I am a Fulton County criminal defense lawyer, and I often appeal from Fulton County convictions. Now we sat here and watched what Fanny did, what Nathan Wade did, what Anna Cross did, and how this whole thing unfolded. And we were shocked. We were disgusted by what we saw, but we don't practice there. We don't, is this normal? Do they just obliterate witnesses on the stand, accuse them of assault with real no charges and you know kind of just wreck their credibility. Okay, maybe, but no, it's shocking, okay? Even this defense attorney says, but it honestly shocked me to see the office act this way, Fanny's, when it knew others were watching. So this guy's even like, whoa. Here's what he says. This much we know. Fulton County DA had an undisclosed relationship indictment relationship with Nathan Wade and paid him three quarters of a million dollars in taxpayer money. She also got at least 13 grand worth of meals and vacations. Now at the hearing, at the disqualification hearing, she defended herself. She said, I paid him back in cash that no one can trace. Always withdrawn from a stash, again, that no one can trace. Says that is not good. But what's worse is how the Fulton County conducted the Willis defense. And I think there's a lot of truth to this. Like they actually made it worse. They lied. They, let me, let me read it. 
at the hearing, it came out that Wade's attorney in his divorce proceeding, Terrence Bradley, had spoken with Ashley Merchant about the relationship. And they had done so in text messages. And Terrence said that the motion for a merchant looks good. And that put Willis's team in an impossible situation. Do you argue that Bradley sharing privileged information that couldn't be admitted to the court, meaning that his statement was true, or do you argue that Bradley's untrustworthy? And in a bizarre turn of events, they did both. They just destroyed him, right? In the same proceeding, Fulton County argued that Brad Bradley only knew Nathan Wade had a pre-appointment relationship with Fanny because he told his lawyer about it in the divorce proceeding. In other words, that is pro talk. That is professional talk. So he can't talk about them indicting each other before Nathan Wade was appointed. But those same prosecutors had just seen Wade swear under oath that the relationship only began after he was appointed, right? So in other words, the prosecutors knew this dude was lying. They put him on the stand or they, when he was on the stand, they invoked his privilege and defended it, even though they knew that he was lying. And then, and then the next question out of his mouth was a lie and they knew it. If the communication was privileged, it was also true. And it contradicted the sworn testimony that prosecutors had just seen Nathan Wade give, okay? So their own prosecutor was lying. They know it's li he's lying because Terrence Bradley was invoking and they were defending him in that. But no one took, no one took their ethical duty seriously enough to pause the hearing and to tell him to tell the truth. And then they d destroyed him. It was crazy. Or nearly as bad, prosecutors could have known full well that the communication wasn't privileged, which it wasn't, because it was bro talk, as the defense was arguing. They could have agreed. And Bradley knew that what he knew as Wade's law partner, but not his lawyer, right? Bro talk. The government could have acquiesced and said, okay, it's bro talk, talk about it, but they didn't. So they let him lie, even though they knew it was bro talk. And that after Bradley received what seemed to be a glut of messages apparently telling him not to testify. So all Fanny's people were coming and hammering him, don't testify. He decided to falsely swear that the communications were privileged so he couldn't tank the trial. In which case, a lawyer obeying her duty of candor to the court should not have argued that her claims, his claims were truthful. It was gross. There were other ways that the, the defense of Fanny disappointed. Wade was constantly evasive. Wade claimed, I don't know how many cabins I went to. He claimed that under oath that he had not had any other relationships while married, but he meant while happily married. I really like that line, right? He didn't know what the definition of married was. Yeah, he did, but he just added the word happily in front of it. That's not what the question asked. Wade's a lawyer, apparently a very smart one, according to Fanny. So he lied on his interrogatories and Fanny lied on her disclo disclosures for public office. Now, meanwhile, Willis bulldozed into the courtroom like the Kool-Aid guy, oh, oh yeah, into the courtroom with testimony so non-responsive and embittered that the trial court had to threaten to strike her testimony. A remedy, he says, I have never seen employed in a Georgia courtroom, right? An ordinary person who came into the court and acted this way would have probably been taken into custody. Wow. Right, I don't practice there. So these little nuances, it's like, okay, interesting. Then there's the simple fact that in an effort to avoid this hearing, Fulton County DAs, they moved for sanctions, okay, against Ashley Merchant. They wanted her to be fined and penalized, claiming she had no good faith as to believe that there was a pre-appointment relationship, despite the fact that they knew full well what Terrence Bradley had told her, whether it was privileged or not. And they did, and, and they were covering up for Terrence and asking for penalties for her while they knew the truth and they hid the truth from the court. It was sick. Now, shockingly, the state dealt with Bradley's potentially devastating out-of-court statements with a completely irrelevant allegation of assault. It's crazy. This evidence was not admissible. They didn't charge him with a crime. The entire goal was to hurt him in front of the largest possible audience. And it was brutal. There was no need for that. It was just like torturing someone who didn't, didn't need it. The dude was already dead, okay? 
Judge Scott McAfee is now in an impossible situation. This is a local defense attorney writing. Says any credibility finding he makes about the Wade, about when the relationship started or whether Wade was reimbursed is bound to come under scrutiny. And it's likely that federal and state investigations into those facts will continue long after he makes his decision. And even if McAfee decides that he cannot consider the privileged information to make his determination, there is no reason why the public could not access this information and make its own decision about whether Nathan and Fanny told the truth. They didn't. But even without making any findings of credibility here, there's an obvious appearance of impropriety. A judge is being asked to seriously consider whether the sitting DA perjured herself in this proceeding. And I believe she 100% did. If this case were in federal court, disqualification would be a no-brainer. Federal prosecutors are not allowed to participate in cases where someone with whom they have a close personal relationship has a financial interest. Substantial. In other words, they can't hire a spouse or a boyfriend to be a special prosecutor. And SCOTUS has also pointed to such rules with approval. And Georgia courts have adopted the reasoning from other cases. Judge McAfee's best option may be to not make any credibility determinations at all, but simply to point to the confirmed conduct and the way that Fulton County lawyers conducted themselves as a basis for disqualification. It was some of the grossest behavior from a government office that we've ever seen. And he, is, as a defense attorney, agrees. Now here, right, here's, here's, here's his, just a reminder, I hate Trump though. There is little doubt in my mind that Trump committed crimes in Georgia. He lied. He encouraged people to falsely rep. But any competent prosecutor could have just charged him on false statements for one claim. But instead, Fulton County, Fannie, they sought to maximize attention and public expenditures, saying, well, of course, for, for Nathan Wade, at millions, a million dollars. It is a shame when the corruption and the incompetence at one level of government keeps us from addressing it at another level. But even the guiltiest defendant deserves a fair trial, and it's not clear that Fulton County has the will or the ability to provide one. So, great article. Local defense attorney. You know, I think he's right on the facts. I still have my reservations about whether the judge ultimately disqualifies her because I can see the judge splitting this, right? The judge saying, well... Yes, they had a relationship. We don't know if there was a financial benefit, but I don't know whether it was material or not to the case. In other words, maybe they'll still do their jobs even if they were indicting each other. Maybe it's not material to the underlying claim. I don't know. If I'm a judge and I had these people come in and lie in my courtroom like they own the courtroom, I'd be furious and I would disqualify Fulton County and write a blistering response. But we don't know what type of pressures are afoot in Fulton County. In fact, the mayor of Atlanta is now supporting Fannie. So she's also in her churches and oh, Atlanta. she's also rallying support from other politicians. And of course, we've got election seasons coming up. And so who knows what's going to happen? Who is putting pressure on whom? What is the White House doing? This judge has a career that he has to think about. And there will be consequences from disqualifying Fannie on the, one of the biggest cases in the country in American history during an election year. So lots of pressure. And now Atlanta and their mayor are joining in on Team Fannie. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens is making headlines for more than one reason. He has announced he plans to seek another term in the 2025 mayoral election. Now, in his time since becoming mayor in 2021, Dickens has tackled affordable housing and crime, noting an 18% crime reduction between 2022 and 2023. But he's also been at odds with some citizens over his support of Atlanta's proposed public safety training facility. The mayor releasing a statement from his office regarding his reelection, saying in part, the I love parts being the mayor right of Atlanta, a job I've wanted since I was 16 years old. I believe we have accomplished a lot in the first two years, and I intend to work hard in the next two years and beyond. And the mayor is also catching the attention of people outside of the metro Atlanta mm -hmm. area this morning. He's going public with his defense of Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis. Fanny. Now, Willis is trying to fend off an attempt to get her thrown from the racketeering case involving former President Donald Trump. Atlanta News First, Rebecca Schramm is joining us live right now from the Fulton County Courthouse. Rebecca, uh, this comes as a judge in that case has a very important decision to make. Yeah, very important. Gervier and Brooks, good morning to you. 
If the judge decides to remove District Attorney Fani Willis and her team from the Trump case, it very well could deliver a fatal blow to that entire case, depending on how everything shakes out. Well, Mayor Andre Dickens decided it was time to stand up for Willis publicly. Take a look. You may have noticed during the disqualification that. hearing last week, Dickens showed up in the courtroom and stayed for several minutes. Attorneys for former President Trump and some of his co-defendants are trying to disqualify. He showed up in court. Now, we didn't see that, but apparently that's him, right, where they're testifying, showing up in solidarity. Willis and her office, in part because of her romantic relationship with a special prosecutor she hired to oversee the case. As the mayor now launches a campaign for a second term, he's determined to make public safety a priority. And he says District Attorney Fonnie Willis has been instrumental in bringing down crime in the city. Here's part of what Mayor Dickens said in an interview on CNN. Yeah, absolutely. I had to go to the courtroom uh, the second day to just lay eyes on her and let her see me. Uh, and for she her, she wasn't to know there the second she's day. Got supportive compassionate leaders in the audience. Uh, you know, when you're going through something like this, you don't want to be made to feel alone. Women are under attack all across America and she shouldn't be made to feel alone. So I went to see women her. are under attack. <laughs> is this like a, uh, is this an epidemic that we're not familiar with? Are DAs all across America sleeping with their special counsel and grifting a million dollars to prosecute their opponents and they're all under attack? Oh no. We better do something about this. They're all indicting their boyfriends and we have to support our women who lie to the court in their filings. Her, and then I went and talked to her and told her, you know, I, I had her back and, you know, wanted her to know that uh, she didn't have to feel like folks weren't uh, supportive of her. Now, as for what's next for the DA, a judge will uh, basically review some evidence that's going to be submitted under seal, and then he could schedule another hearing for as soon as this Friday. We're looking forward to it. We also had some reaction from another local prosecutor, a DeKalb County prosecutor. He says there's not enough here, man. Everything is perfectly above board, right? It was all salacious stuff. So here's another clip from local news, and we're gonna hear from this guy. This has some good clips as well. well. Tonight, we are awaiting the next steps in the Georgia election interference case. During a hearing last week, attorneys for former President Donald Trump and eight of his co-defendants pushed to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and her team from trying the case over allegations of misconduct. Love and Life's Grace King joining us live in the studio now. So Grace, I want to say the entire world was watching we this were. testimony. Yeah, Two days crazy. of testimony last week. You were paying very close attention to it. Where do things go from here? Well, that was the evidentiary hearing where both sides presented witnesses and documents to build their case. But next, Judge McAfee will set what's called a summation hearing. Good. That's where both sides will make their arguments to the judge. And then after that, Judge Scott McAfee will have to rule on whether to keep or disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis and or Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. I spoke with former DeKalb County DA Robert James about the likelihood of that. It is a lie. It is, it is a lie. As tensions flared in the Fulton County Courthouse, former DeKalb County District Attorney Robert James listened closely. A lot of drama, a lot of bombshells, a lot of entertainment for, for some people, depending on your perspective or take. It was entertaining, but ultimately, that's for sure. the issue is whether or not DA Fonnie Willis financially benefited from hiring Nathan Wade. To him, the two days of testimony from District Attorney Fonnie Willis, Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, and about half a dozen others didn't show proof of a conflict Danny or Daddy. even the appearance of such. In this case, that impropriety has to be financial benefit, financial gain, and not the fact that they were having a romantic relationship. You know. Well, there was a lot of gain there. She went on multiple cruises and her lover wouldn't have been able to go if he didn't have money and income. So not only did he pay for stuff for her, but he also went, and that's a benefit, right? He wouldn't have been able to go on cruises. She wouldn't have had her boyfriend with her had he not had that income that she was giving to him. Oh, it can't just be related. It's got to be proof. And the defendants have the burden of showing that D.A. Fani Willis financially benefited. She doesn't have to prove anything or disprove anything. What could matter is when the Wade-Willis relationship started. The judge, you know, wants to look at, you know, when 
financial gain may have started and whether or not that happened when she was making the hire. A man who may know that answer is Terrence Bradley, Nathan Wade's former law partner and one-time divorce attorney. I did not have personal knowledge. Bradley yes, claims did. almost everything yes, he did. knows about the relationship is protected by attorney-client no, privilege. But a late afternoon exchange Friday prompted Judge Scott McAfee to re-examine whether his privilege applies. When asked by the state, he went into a factual scenario that, to my mind, I don't see how it relates to privilege at all. And so now I'm left wondering if Mr. Bradley has been properly interpreting privilege this entire time. No, he has not. Now that outstanding question will determine whether Bradley will be called back to the stand before oral arguments begin. As for when this could all happen, Judge Scott McAfee says he anticipates this case will be back on court on Friday or next week. We'll see. All right, my friend. So we're going to be, of course, covering this when it does drop. But Fannie is rallying support circling the wagons, going to another church and asking for their prayers, along with getting the mayor, Andre, to show up in court, say, we've got your back because we protect women against infidelity accusations, I guess. So we're going to be covering it, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Going to be a lot of Trump prosecution news here. We're going to be covering it all. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for liking this video wherever you're watching it. Thanks for inviting a friend or family member to come and join us. Thanks for checking out WatcherLodge.com. Links are in the description below. We got a bunch of free events coming up this month. We'd love to have you join us. They're taking place on Zoom. They're going to be a lot of fun. And we'll look forward to seeing you there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. And now we got one final segment on the day. And we're going across the pond to our friends in the UK. And we're seeing what's happening with Julian Assange. Julian Assange, you know him from WikiLeaks, is fighting extradition to the United States. His case has been on warrant status here for quite some time, going all the way back to May 23rd, 2019. Our federal government really, really wants this guy. And he's fighting to stop them from getting him in the UK. We're going to see what happened there in the UK courts and try to interpret how they handle these matters. We're going to hear from Stella. Julian Assange's wife and other people who were protesting outside the courtroom, RFK Jr. is also here saying it's time to free Julian. And he's joined by other people from Congress who also submitted this letter to Joe Biden saying it is time. But let's see what happened outside the courtroom. This is Julian Assange's wife. Her name is Stella and others outside in the UK. Free Julian Assange. There is no possibility of a fair trial if Julian is extradited to the United States. He should never be extradited to the United States. He would never be safe. The United States plotted to murder my husband. He is being accused of journalism. CIA. <laughs> Assange's father's there. Former labor leader Jeremy Corbyn's there. And reporters without borders. The world's mad at the minute, and we need people like Assange to come out and tell the truth. You know, expose what's going on. They don't want that. Assange for us, um, for me, he's a hero. You know, he's an advocate for truth, peace, justice. And, you know, I'm here today because we want to make sure that he doesn't get extradited to the U.S. Okay, so that's what's happening there in the UK. And we also have some updates on what took place in the court proceeding. Before we see what took place over there, here is another excerpt from RFK Jr. who's also on line supporting Julian Assange. I think if he did that, the likelihood that that happens, uh, zero. So here is what took place there. BBC is reporting that Julian Assange 
was in court and lawyers described the U.S. prosecution from our DOJ as state retaliation. Does that happen elsewhere in America? We have the, the state retaliating against other people in America? Yeah, we definitely do. So here's the background. Mr. Assange, Julian, has been in Belmarsh, a UK prison, since 2019. Now, America wants this guy, the US, for disclosing secret military files all the way back in 2010 and 2011. Now, there's a two-day high court hearing which began on Tuesday. His team said it's, it's against the UK law to transmit him out. But if the appeal is turned down, Assange could be extradited to the United States within weeks. And then if, as soon as he comes back, the warrant is going to be quashed and the case will pick back up, right? It'll be back on for a trial. Now, Edward Fitzgerald is one of his lawyers. He said that the U.S.'s prosecution was, quote, politically motivated. He argued, he said, you know, Mr. Assange was exposing serious criminality and he disclosed documents that the U.S. was upset about. He said, you know, my client is being prosecuted for engaging in the ordinary journalistic practice of obtaining and publishing classified information, information that is both true and obvious and if, uh, of important public interest. Another lawyer said that the U.S. sought retribution for his political opinions, one of the many bars to extradition from the UK. So if they're trying to punish you politically, UK says we're not going to let you leave. This is a paradigm example of state retaliation for the expression of political opinion. The lawyers also argued that their client was at the real risk of further extrajudicial actions by the CIA. Stella says that they try to kill him. A legally delicate way of saying he could be assassinated or he could be subject to some harm beyond their control. Now, their allegation is not evidentially tested. I guess he has to try to kill him. You know, he has to try to be killed first. Is that the CIA plotted to kill Mr. Assange during the seven years he took refuge in Ecuador's London embassy. Mr. Summers told the judges that then U.S. President Trump they say Trump asked for detailed options on how to kill Assange. I'm sure that's not true. I'm sure the CIA did that through Pompeo. Trump was considering pardoning them. But of course, everything is Trump's fault. Who was not present in court on Tuesday, Assange was sick apparently. Sketches were even drawn up, he said, adding that the evidence of this was truly a breathtaking plan. And in written submissions, he and Fitzgerald added, they said, the evidence showed that the U.S. was prepared to go to any lengths, including misusing its own criminal justice system, to sustain impunity for U.S. officials in respect to the war crimes. And Mr. Assange was one of these targets. And it, or it was orchestrated through Pompeo. Now, two years later, a British judge ruled that while the U.S. had shown it had a legitimate criminal case against Assange, he could not be transferred because he might harm himself. The U.S. later overturned that ruling after giving the U.K. new assurances about how Assange would be treated. We're not going to hurt him. At this week's hearing, largely seen as a last-ditch attempt effort from Assange, Assange lawyers are asking for permission to challenge the extradition again. If they fail to convince the judges, Assange must be extradited within 28 days. And of course, they're saying this is going to determine whether he lives or dies. And so that's what happened there. Here is Stella. She's explaining the CIA tried to kill him. So today was uh, a day of legal arguments, but really what it was was an indictment of a rogue agency the Central Intelligence Agency, which runs, it pops up in each of the arguments. Whether it was Julian exposing their torture program and their involvement in illegal killings or their own plots to murder him. Throughout, this, the origin of this prosecution came about when the CIA head, Mike Pompeo, lost the plot. He lost the plot and then he instrumentalized his agency to go after a, a, a media organization to plot the murder of a journalist and to imprison a publisher in London. 
they lost the plot. Whatever happens in the coming days, it's now been aired in court. The murder plot, the political motivation coming out of Mike Pompeo's obsession with killing Julian, and the murders that Julian exposed in Iraq and Afghanistan, the torture program that European countries willingly participated in. We free Julian, we regain our democracy. Let's free Julian, come back here tomorrow. Free Assange. All right, so of course we know that our CIA and our intelligence agencies are nasty agencies who are trying to control information everywhere. They will even create fake letters of 51 intelligence experts who will create lies for all of America to consume and they'll endorse it. So now we have a letter from Congress to Joe Biden. And this is signed by a bunch of different people who not normally are not normally on the same page. So this is curious. We've got James McGovern, Thomas Massey, Rashida Taleb is on this, okay? Ilhan Omar's on this one. We got Ayanna Presley, Jay Appel's on here, Jamal Bowman, the fire alarm guy, and AOC's on here. What on earth? Now, who else signed this puppy? Rand Paul, Jesus Garcia, Corey Bush is on this list, Rosendale. We've got Marjorie Taylor Greene's on this list, Paul Gosar. And Eric Berlinson, we got a bunch. We got a bunch of names. Like they, they all definitely didn't sign this in the same room together, right? Because I'm pretty sure Marjorie and AOC might have gone blows at each other, which would have been fun to watch. But you know, they probably passed this around, right? It's not, not. They all didn't sign at the same time. But some good names on here. Some also whack jobs on here. But some good names. And here's what they're saying. They say, "All right, Joe Biden." Oh wait, this is an old letter. But this is what, uh, uh, he just posted this. Thomas Massey just reposted this, so let me read it. He said, as members of Congress deeply committed to the principles of free speech, Massey's reopening this. He says, we strongly encourage your administration to withdraw the extradition request. He says, Julian, the founder of WikiLeaks, faces multiple charges under the Espionage Act. He's been detained in London for some time. And there are deep concerns about this case about how this is impacting human rights and press freedoms. Many entities like the New York Times, The Guardian, and others have come together to express their grave concerns, saying publishing is not a crime. In December, a coalition of, of press freedom, civil liberties people, and many others wrote to Attorney General Merrick Garland, saying, please abandon the relentless pursuit of Assange. We have to protect the ability to report freely on the United States. U.S. elected officials have also previously called on this administration to drop the charges. Why? The First Amendment, which we have paid less attention to in recent years. We believe the DOJ acted correctly in 2013 when you declined to charge Mr. Assange for publishing the classified documents. You said it would, it would be a dangerous precedent, Joe. And we note that the Espionage Act was intended to punish government employees and contractors, not journalists. We're aware that even people in China are saying that the U.S. is very hypocritical when it comes to media freedoms. Of course, it's only the media freedoms that they want us to have. It's the duty of journalists to seek out sources saying the United States must not pursue this unnecessary prosecution. We urge you to ensure this case is brought to a close, signed by all of those people. And that was last year, but I saw Thomas Massey just re-up this as this story breaks. So we're going to keep our eye on the Julian Assange case. Of course, he is in warrant status right now. But let me show you what's happening on the docket because a lot of people are sending letters in. You can see... This was a letter to the court by Jill Michaels. This was sent just about a month ago. She sent this one in. She's telling the court, I am an 80 year old American born and raised citizen who pleads with you to defend the first amendment. This prosecution is an embarrassment to our government. It was embarrassing to our government 
since it revealed our war crimes and the conniving of the DNC to subvert Hillary's primary and other unpleasant truths that we all need to know. Now, as citizens, we have a right to know the truth and a right to know what's being done in our names and finance with our dollars. Please defend our rights and free Assange. Signed by Jill Michaels, right? And so a bunch of people are just sending letters in. Here's another letter motion. This one from Joanna says, please dismiss this case. Here's another one from John Young. People are just sending letters in, but you can see the arrest warrant was issued. Another arrest warrant was issued. June 24th, we had the, I think the first one was issued back in 2019. So an original arrest warrant there, and then other arrest warrants with new indictments and so on. So it is going to be an interesting case when this one does drop. And we're going to be here continuing to cover it, my friends. We're going to be hoping that there is some progress in this case. It's been one that we've been covering sort of in the back pocket for a while. And we're going to see what happens in the UK. And so, my friends, thank you for joining us on this one. We're going to keep our eye on it. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for liking this video, for sharing it with a friend, for inviting them to come over to our channel and join us as we cover First Amendment activities. And we continue to watch the watchers always. All right, my friends, that is it for us in the day. On the day, we did cover some good ground. Julian Assange fighting extradition. Fanny is getting some support from the mayor and also going to church begging for prayers. And Jack Smith continues to fight to keep the names and the evidence in his case against Trump sealed. But now, it is time to hear from you. Let's see what you have to say about all of this and more. We are, after we're done here, going to go over to watching the watchers. Locals.com for our members only after party. We do streams in the morning. We do streams on Saturday and we do after parties and watching the watchers.locals.com is a great place to come meet new people and carry on the conversation with us. We'll love to see you there. But now my friends, let us hear from you and let's see who is joining us on the day we had some great donos come in starting off is quantum thug life what's up quantum thug life who quantums it out in multiple dimensions or thugs it out in multiple dimensions adam m is coming in just cause got a membo we got hollywood h's in the house ryan h and trevor s all courtesy of quantum thank you quantum for bringing in our five newest of Membos. We got another one from Rob. He says, watch and play my meme video posted on X under the live. It's 45 seconds, the destruction of the New York City because of judicial tyranny. We got this one from Al says, I find it amusing every time you say Fanny and Wade went to Norway. Uh, Norwegian cruise lines cruise all over. It was probably a Caribbean cruise. I, well, it still sounds like Norway to me. So they went to Norway in my mind, but they went on a cruise. <laughs> It sounds like they went to Norway. Doesn't that sound it? Well, we don't know. Maybe they did go to Norway. I don't know. We don't know. But thank you, Al, for the clarification. It is pretty funny, isn't it? <laughs> Quarter Native says a load of people don't seem to understand that Fanny isn't being sued in the traditional sense. Can you explain like we're five exactly what type of suit against Fanny and Wade this is? Yeah, so it's definitely not a lawsuit at all. It's an evidentiary hearing. We're in the middle of a criminal trial. And the defense attorneys said that Fannie had done something bad. So it's a defense motion. They're like the plaintiffs. They get to bring the claim. They have the burden of proof to show their claim. And so they said Fannie did something bad and Fannie was on the defense, but it was like a miniature hearing tucked in the middle of a criminal trial. So that's all, it wasn't a separate proceeding or anything. And, and prosecution and judicial immunity re regarding class actions and liability type suits from we the people. Well, gosh, these are like complicated, like, what is this, like a law school exam? Good Lord. All right, I'm just kidding, Quarter. I'm just, I'm just kidding. So class actions and uh, there's, a, there's a, a justiciability problem with the people suing the government. It's called a political question. If you want to look into this, it's actually complicated, but there's a political question doctrine that says if it's a political question that you're, you want to sue the government over, you don't get to sue them. The, the best way to cause change in your government is not through the courts, it's you go vote. So if, it's, if you're trying to sue the government over something that you can vote about, then you should go vote. 
you don't get to sue. So that's the general response. You know, why can't we just sue for these things? The courts will just dismiss it. They'll say, you have no standing. It's a political question. Go vote. And I'd like to just show your vid, LOL. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, thank you, coordinator, for being a good sport. Complicated questions, keeping me on my feet. I like it. Glocky says, according to the Gateway Pundit, this affected a case from 2002, and the defendants in the case didn't find out until last month. They say it's a major ethics violation, and they're filing paperwork with the proper authorities. That's definitely Angeron's areola on your screen. Yeah. And yeah, I, I did see that. Apparently, there was um, some rumors that Angeron may have indicted someone at some point, sometime, somewhere. That's over at the Gateway Pundit. Thank you for that, Clocky. We got, and I, you know, I don't know what, what that is. It's, it's an old story from 2002, I think. I don't know if he was a lawyer or a judge, so I don't know how relevant it is. My big thing is I can't believe that guy slept with anybody. I mean, honestly, it's wild. PB's dad is here. What's up, PV's dad in the house, our newest supporter. Thank you for joining us, PV's dad. Glocky says, I'm amazed at the fact that they are concerned about witness safety when a majority of the witnesses are tax paid and trained federal agents with tax funded firearms. They carry 24 seven and carry anywhere they want. Uh, that's a good point. Like the FBI agents are like, I'm really scared about being under attack by Trumpers. Like, relax. You're an FBI agent. Calm down. Senevis says, if you're interested, the Sean Ryan show, former Navy SEAL, interviews war heroes, another interesting guest. Sounds like a great show. He interviewed Tim Parlatori for a two-part episode. I know Tim. He's a former, I don't know him, but I know of him. He went into some detail on what kind of documents that were marked classified. They were basically old presidential itineraries that are classified when issued, but obviously irrelevant after they are executed. It's from December, so it predates a lot, but it's still interesting. You're the man, Rob. You're the man, Senevis. Thanks for the great suggestion. Tim is talking like that? He, he's doing like podcasts like that? Hmm. I wonder if he'll, uh, you know, talk to other people about, about the evidence in the case. That's great. So interesting. Okay, I'll take a look at that and I'll keep my eye on Tim. That's a lot of fun. Sounds like a great show. Probably a good one to subscribe to. Glocky's here. Says, LMAO, I just tried using Microsoft AI to generate a picture of Jack Smith getting sniffed by Biden, and it's a violation. <laughs> uh, please create a picture of Jack Smith being sniffed by Joe. Content warning. This prompt has been blocked. Our system says it's against the, con against the content policy. Yeah, you're going to need a state-of-the-art meme smith to do that one, I think. Crash says on Locals, Rob, how many bites at the apple does Jack get? Cannon needs to tell him to suck it up, buttercup. Grow a set. This is not the Hague. If I need secret service protection, if I need security, then I just need it. Suck it up. <laughs> That's from Corey Bush. Um, yeah, you're right. Cannon should tell Jack Smith to suck it up, buttercup. That would just be great. Hey, Crash says, you know, Smith's a whiny little bee. Why is Judge Cannon even entertaining these arguments? Well, because she has to. It's kind of her job, unfortunately. This old guy says, I think Jack Smith has gotten away with prosecuting war criminals at The Hague, apparently along with Fanny's father, who apparently was in the Black Panthers, where I doubt a lot of consideration is given to the defendant. He's a corrupt piece of work. You're right about that, this old guy. There's no doubt about that. Um, okay, there's a meme. All right, we're going to leave that one alone, Glocky, just because, you know, there's a, there's a, it's, it's Lincoln getting, you know, assassinated, but yeah, you, you know, YouTube gets squirrely with certain things when you're us. Senevi says, Parlator, Trump's lawyer made the point that besides from George H. Bush, Trump is the only president who didn't know if he'd spend four more years in DC or not. So sorting the documents was a last minute ordeal. They also decided they would not build him a presidential library where they'd store his documents so no one gave him guidance on what to do with the documents. Then they reached out to NARA in regards to the records and didn't hear back until they were told they were in trouble. It is a banana republic. Yeah, and then they tell us like their talking points are Trump obstructed. And then in their own filings, they say that they sent FBI agents down there to surveil the place and Trump walked in and said, hello. Trump's like, hi, FBI, how are you guys? I hope you have everything you need. And they're like, hmm, well, we're here investigating you. And they were literally like scoping out the cameras and stuff. So Trump thinks he's cooperating. They're literally investigating him to prosecute him. 
it's all a political attack, clearly. We got Rob says, Lincoln didn't give his life. His life was stolen by a Democrat with a pistol. Great, great comment, Rob. Gator Aaron, what's up, our newest supporter? Gator Aaron in the house. Glocky says, okay, so let me get this straight. The federal government investigated his finances. New York just got done investigating his finances. And not one link has been found between Trump and Russia. But all of a sudden, Putin has something on Trump. That's Nancy for you. Says, maybe our allies should pay for their fair share and actually fund and equip their armed forces instead of paying billions to have welfare nations from Glocky. We got Crash. Says, those who invented the guillotine, they fell prey to the blade themselves. Those who don't know history will fall prey to it and repeat it. Nancy, the same people in powers, like the WEF and Soros, they're going to come after you. And yeah, that's always the case. It's like, you can be a DEI wokester and like be all of the proper things. But as soon as you disagree with one thing that's orthodoxy, and, and, and you will, because the orthodoxy is always changing and they're always you know cutting something else off of somebody, then you are now an enemy of their state. So they come for you, it always turns. That's why just stick to your principles and anchor those in and, and we'll be all right. Senevi says, it's wild to me that you need to put up the fine in order to appeal. If you're innocent but cannot afford to post money to appeal, what then? Do you lose? Obviously, the dollar amount in Trump's case is ridiculous, but as a practice generally, it seems unjust. Yeah, it's the same for everything. I mean, if you appeal any misdemeanor verdict, even a traffic ticket, right? You got to post, you know, you got a $250 traffic ticket. You go to a trial, you lose. You want to appeal it. Got to post the bond, and then you can appeal it. But yeah, you got to have money in our legal system. Also, it doesn't work that well. Michael Woodward says Trump should just show up and pay with $500 million in pennies. I like it. Yeah, here. No, it's right here. No, there's another truck coming. There's another dump truck coming. Yeah, where do you want it? Right here in your lobby? Perfect. Felix says, don't forget Hillary Clinton and her comments. The Democrats are all the communists and by evidence, witnesses against Democrats wind up as being self-expired. Yeah, that's true. There is a history of that. Felix, look at this dono. My goodness, man. What a nice dono from our friend Felix. A big one. Says this whole use of the federal government as a weapon has put a gigantic weight on the Supreme Court. I said it once and I'll say it again. She has the spirit of Jezebel. These churchgoers will be held to account with the highest authority if they do not repent. Woo! That's a spicy one, Felix. And I think you're right about the Supreme Court. And I have a feeling that Trump is going to be two for two on that one. Now, what they're doing here is insane. I mean, they're putting the Supreme Court in the position to make decisions on these cases that are clearly not even, you know, valid legal theories. I'm talking, of course, about the ballot removal. I'm talking about the immunity decision. I think Trump is going to win both of those, personally. He'll be on the ballots, and there'll be presidential immunity that covers him. Now, I do have some concerns on the immunity thing. I think that they might, you know, the Supreme Court get, could get kind of cute on this thing and say, yeah, there's presidential immunity, and it, and it applies to the president after they leave, and it covers outer perimeter stuff and all the things. But Trump stuff is not inside the outer perimeter or something like that, right? Try to be cute about it. But I'm not sure that's going to work out for them that well. But yeah, the Supreme Court has some big decisions and they are shoving it in their face. And what's going to happen if the Supreme Court does come out two for two for Trump? They're going to say the Supreme Court's rigged and it needs to be packed and we have to do something about this. So they're going to set themselves up to embrace that narrative and they're going to try to parlay that into, to, into some enthusiasm in 2024, whether it works out or not for them. I don't think it will. Knox is here. Happy Tuesday, all. Says, Fanny should have worn that black dress to court. The organ music in the background is hilarious. I know, it's like, it's like a Netflix production, you know? It's like, she's telling you this like very astute point about scripture and how it applies to her infidelities. Anyways, Felix says, pray that they all repent. 
from Felix in the house. We'll see if they do. I doubt it. Fred is here, says, I've got it. I know what to do. Borrow 500 million from Deutsche Bank. Use Mar-a-Lago for collateral. Wouldn't that be awesome? And then they, he'd probably get, you know, charged again for that, Fred. It's a good idea. And then they could, because Deutsche Bank testified at the trial, right? They could just, oh, just do business with them again. They're like, see, we're not victims. Here's another 500 million. Thanks, Fred. Shout out to Johnny over there. Knox is here, says, maybe she can start a mega church like Joel Osteen, another person <laughs> from Knox. Maybe she could. She's, she's got two church appearances now under her belt. Just Me says, I'm getting kind of old and forgetful. I just realized I could be a Dem presidential candidate. Uh, but, um, but who was our, our allies during World War II? Who did Roosevelt and Truman ally with? Who could it be? Was it Stalin? You're right. It was. Yeah, that's right. And we had the two fronts against Germany. And that whole thing may have gone differently, right? If Germany didn't invade Russia. That's very interesting history. That alternative timeline stuff. What if Hitler didn't make that mistake? Would the future of Europe have gone differently? Who knows? But yeah, and then they tell us that Putin's a giant communist who imprisons his opponents and throws them off the ballots and censors speech in his country. And we're like, you mean like what you're doing in America? Okay, thanks. Mexican Marauder is in the house, says, do you think in 10 to 20 years down the road that these cases will be taught as what not to do in law school? They will be marked as traitors to law. Well, it depends what cases you're talking about. I think ballot removal is, that's going to be looked at, looked at as a boneheaded thing, or always was, I think, from the very beginning. Hopefully, SCOTUS agrees. Immunity, I think, is a better question since it's never been tried before. You know, they, they don't really, in law school, they don't really, like, oftentimes hit you with a con. Like, it's not like, there are some cases, right, like Dred Scott and other things, where, like, gosh, that was, like, a disaster, right? Like, dread, like disaster, like, universally reviled opinions. I don't know that these will be like that. I think that the left will probably, you know, blame the Supreme Court, honestly. Like the they're the left is is are the law are the law schools. Like they own the the law schools, they own the colleges, they own academia. So they'll they'll rewrite history to support their interpretation of it. Sportfish says, Rob, a headline on the Gateway Pundit is Angeron is accused of some other things with opposing counsel. Yeah, and that is an interesting story that we'll wait for it to percolate a little bit more. Tony Hay is bringing in new members. C. Warren is coming in from Tony Hay. Fui Beghart is here. Tam Tam is coming in and Gitmo Holiday is here. Can you go on holiday and Gitmo? Bilal R. is joining us, all brought in courtesy of Tony Hay Munkets in the house. Very nice to see you. We got Ryan PD is here. What's up, Ryan? Says, I would love to see you have a chat about Fanny with the lead attorney. Shout out to the lead attorney, Ryan. That sounds like a good idea. And we'll keep that one in mind to see if we can do something together. Knox is sharing this one from, this one is the Fanny Willis one. We'll, uh, we won't play that here today because of the music in there, Knox, but it's a great one. The, sharing a link to, you may have seen it. It's Nathan Wade answering the cabin question. And he fantasizes about Fanny Willis. It's fun. And this one uh, from Knox. Wow, here's a new article. Apparently Knox is sharing this one. Maybe we'll talk about this tomorrow. Hunter Biden claims the DOJ mistook sawdust for cocaine. Oh, that sounds fun. Interesting. Thank you for that, Knox. I'll look at that one maybe tomorrow. Flagpole guy on locals says, Proverbs 2023 20, says, the Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please him. Let us pray for blind justice. Woo, that's a good one, flagpole. Proverbs 2023. 20, John McGarvey's in the house bringing in, what's up, John? John helps a lot here around the house and we're grateful for John. He's bringing in 10 new members as well. Look who this is coming in. Key C, Dan D, Ann S, Rick O, Matt H, JC the Music Man. We got Keister Bunnies in the house. Charles S, Alan B, and Kendall W, all coming in courtesy of John McGarvey in the house. 
and John has some great wisdom here. Says they are trying to discourage you. Take a breath. And vote Trump 2024. We're ready to go. John's been a member for 19 months, been modding the fort down for us, been very helpful around here. John, we're grateful for you being here. And that's two months and then some on the baby. Two babies and then some. Amazing. And you're right, honestly, I think they are trying to discourage you. Or maybe it's not actively discourage you, but it's to deviate you from staying engaged. And I think that's that's as big of a concern. Like, discourage you, I think is right, right? Discouraging you from par even participating. Like, it's a lot more benign, like dangerously benign than I think people even realize. Like, let's say you're not actively feeling discouraged. You just get kind of tired of politics. And so you go talk about football or golf or whatever else you're into, right? But you just don't stay engaged. That's a problem too, because we want people to stay engaged. We want people to drag everyone they know to the polls. We really want to create energy around the work that we're doing. And that's why we're here. And that's why you're here, John. That's why you're here bringing in new members. We're all doing it together and we're grateful for your support. We're looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a good, good year. Glocky says, black youths in Atlanta are being killed in record numbers. People are arrested but not convicted of anything. They're dropping dead in the jails. Atlanta can't pay its water bill. And this moronic mayor is backing the DA responsible for it all? Yeah, well, she's a woman under attack, Glocky. You know, what can you do? Chubby says, it sounds to me like Fanny might have a chance at some Dickens indicating... If they aren't already in closed sessions, she did make it clear that her and Wade weren't indicting any, each other anymore. Maybe Dickens is the new Wade? Uh, I don't know. Who is that? I'm drawing a total blank, Chubby. Who is that person? Am I missing something? Who is Dickens? Maybe Dickens is the new Wade? Like Wade will be booted off as the special prosecutor and someone else will be substituted in. Stephen Evans is here, says Fanny has needs. She was very lonely and her 50th birthday party was just terrible, okay? She had to drink Grey Goose all by herself. Pinochet says, I consider myself the sheep that got lost when it comes to religion, but I'm pretty sure there was something about thou shall not bear false witness. Yeah, a lot of people could have some other uh, scripture for Fanny. Someone else should send her some other scripture. Send her that one. Hey, Fanny, that shall not bear. Have you read this one? This one's great. Read this one, Fanny. Thank you, Pinochet. Salty Old Guy says, how funny would it be if Trump got a loan to cover the $450 million appeal by using Mar-a-Lago as collateral? Yeah, with the same bank, like former said, with Deutsche. You know, and so it's like, we're back in the same business again. Oh, maybe they'll sue him again, right? They'll sue him again. Felix says, keep this in mind if you find yourself being prosecuted in Atlanta, in Fulton County, Georgia, because use, the use of perjury by prosecutors is about every board when in the hot seat. So in other words, they'll do anything in the, in the world to, to get what they want done. And it was gross to see. Even that other defense attorney agreed. Uh, John McGarvey's here. He says, let me try this one. I just want to say that Russia is evil and we need to fund Ukraine to the maximum effect. Did I do that correctly? Yeah, John, that's, I think that's exactly right. Like that's a, are you auditioning for MSNBC? You should call Jen Psaki. She'll have you on the show tomorrow. Felix says it's the C Central Intelligence Assassination Agency, AKA the CIA. We got new members. Welcome aboard, Mark. And new YouTube members, remember, you can join us on Telegram if you want to download that app. Navigate over to the Community tab section on the YouTube channel homepage. Scroll down, grab the private Telegram link, and that's where you can join us for the after party and chat with some amazing people. Gregory S. is also joining us. Gregory, good to see you. Welcome aboard. We got drama must remain on the stage. Says Fanny thought Nathan was important, not impotent, which I think is a good take on that. Yeah, because you want to be with somebody who is important. You know, you're like, oh, he's an important man or she's an important woman, but not impotent. Very important letter R there. That one letter R can cause a big, a big problem, you know, 
if you're Fanny and you need a good indictment. Jennifer is here, says, thank you for another great show. You rock. Thank you, Jennifer, for a lovely dono and for being a membo and supporting our work here. Couldn't do it without you. Very grateful for that. George is here. George, praise him, says, am I the only one that thought that the Judge Angeron signature looked like a nipple? Oh, my gosh. You're right. It does. It's like an A with an E through it, and it kind of looks like a squishy nip. Weird. That dude has a thing for nips, doesn't he? <sighs> George, great observation. Very astute. This one from Dolphin Fan is the man is bringing in new membos. What's up, Dolphin? Bringing in Mitch M. Mrs. Hayes is coming in. Grammy B. What's up, Grammy B and NC? We got Robert C. and Peanuts Nana is in the house. Welcome aboard, Peanuts Nana. Brought in courtesy of Dolphin Fan is the man in the house. Uh, no, thanks for, thanks for dropping salt in the wound. Did you get one of 1,000 pair if Trump's golden shoes? No. First of all, I didn't realize they were going to sell out in like two seconds. Otherwise, I absolutely would have bought some and put them back here. I think they look awesome. And I'm not even a sneakers person. But I think that they just look great. And I really want a pair, but you know, they're going for like $5,000 now. Sheesh. Anyways, one day we'll see if they do another, another drop. Facts matter. What's up? Facts says, wow, a nice dono says waiting on our oldest college acceptances. And all I can think of is it's time to fork over all of our money to liberal psychos. Pray of us that she doesn't turn into a liberal. Gosh, facts. Yeah, that's a big thing, right? And I heard that. I heard, I think like, um, didn't Bill Ackman? Bill Ackman has been the person responsible for like obliterating Harvard in many ways. One of them, many other people working, doing great work there. But I think Bill Ackman, the, the Claudine Gay guy, his, something like that happened to his daughter. Like he paid them like millions of dollars, sent his daughter to Harvard. She came back a communist. He's like one of the greatest capitalists in America, so-called. And, you know, then he comes out and his daughter's like a little commie. Like, what the heck did that, what, what did I just invest in? I'm not saying that's going to happen to you, facts matter. Your daughter is probably a lot more intelligent, but you never know. These things can go awry. Colleges are, you know, having to demonstrate their value. And I'm not sure that it's still there. But anyways, you guys are going to make the right decision. Your daughter's going to be smart and come out fortified against lefties. I think I came out of college more conservative. I was like, these people are whacked everywhere. I was, I don't think I was even that political until I got, I mean, I was sort of political, but in college I was like, what are they teaching me? This is insane. But you know, it, you got to look to your mama. It's got to have a good mama. I got a good mama. Facts matter. You're a good mama. You'll, she'll be okay. Quarter native says, Fanny should have been sent Thou shalt not commit adultery. Just saying. LOL. Someone should send her that. Hopefully she gets some new scriptures. Ike's girl says, does Anna Cross look like Nikki Haley? Just saying. Yes. She does. Does Anna Cross look like Nikki Haley? She does. Yeah, she actually absolutely does. Good, good eye. Ravica says, Rob, can you mention flagpole guy? And Rick Becker, shout out to flagpole guy and Rick Becker. Apparently Rick Becker, whoa, is running for the U.S. House and has a 100% conservative score. Flagpole guy is a Marine and now is a huge patriot in North Dakota, putting up hundreds of flagpoles a year. That's awesome. That's awesome. Are you serious? So that's really cool. A uh, shout out to both those guys, right? Rick Becker is running for Congress. We need some good Congress people and conservatives, amazing, and flagpole guy. That sounds awesome. So shout out to both of these guys. Jere Jeremiah says, oorah, over on Locals. And so shout out to both of you guys. Thanks for the plug, Ravicus. Very cool. V is never silent says, you know, I was quite the, catty, the chatty Kathy this morning on our morning stream. It was my first time catching the morning show. Well, we love, you know, we love our morning chats. And that is, uh, it's great to have you. V is never silent. Always good to come and join us. We have great morning streams. That's on Locals. And it's great to see you. V is never silent. 
in the house. My friends, very generous donos today. Thank you so much for sending all of those in. Let's say hello to our friends on the X platform before we wrap it up and go over to locals for our members only after party. We've got 29 viewers over on locals. Whoa, amazing. Oh, here our meme smith, Paul Me Knows in the house. What's up, Paul? Good to see you, my friend. He says, uh, Dork Brandon is here. There's Dork Brandon. So Joe Biden is doing that thing where he thinks he's like really cool and hip. And Paul Mino is showing us he looks like a clown. Vienti Kiss is saying free Julian Assange in the house. Good to see you, V. Says the CIA stands for Corporate Interest Agency. Says three-letter agencies hate you for having rights, privacy, and knowledge. That's theirs. That's their purview. Take those three things away from the people and you can control them. After all, these agencies are de facto arms of the ultra wealthy. I think it's a great comment, V. Good one on that one. Danny says, why didn't they swear in Fanny? I think they did. I think that it was just kind of a, a weird exchange. We got CF Rob is in the house and Rob is taught Rob. So over on X, this is CF Rob. And so I'll encourage you to go follow this one and watch that video on your own time. But thank you for sharing that, Rob, and posting that on the X thread. This is what you, this is where you can go if you want to follow us and join in on the comments at Rob Govea ESQ on the X platform. And it's a great way to follow other watchers out there, support them when they're out in the wild, and watch the show as well. But my friends. That is it for us on the day. This is from Crash. She says, Rob, it wasn't Ackman who obliterated Harvard. It was the plagiarist and Harvard itself. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, they brought it on themselves. I think Ackman was just very vocal about it as a former Harvard guy and someone who donated a bunch to Harvard. It was kind of interesting to watch one of their own flip on them. And I think it lended some credibility to the arguments that they're a bunch of plagiarist hacks. So anyways, point well taken, Crash. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We covered some good ground today. We are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. Come and join us over there. If you want to sign up for our daily newsletter, you can do that at robertgovea.com. That way you get all of our show segments bundled up and delivered right to your inbox so you never miss a thing. Also, our PDFs are over there if you want to download those. WatcherLodge.com, links in the description. This Thursday, you have to join us. It's going to be a ton of fun. My friend Mike Voltz is very smart, very articulate, and he's going to walk us through building food sovereignty into your life so that you're not dependent on other people for food in the event of an emergency. He's got a great framework, a lot of knowledge. He's thought about this a lot, and he's going to come share that with us. We're going to do it on Zoom. So come with your cameras on. Come prepared to take notes. Come prepared to answer, uh, ask questions if you want. All free, watcherlodge.com. Links are in the description below. Next week, we have Zen Wellness with my friend Jason Campbell, another genius. And so he's going to come and share that with us as well. Register for these so you can get the Zoom links, watcherlodge.com. All right. But my friends, that is it for us on the day. I want to thank our amazing mods and our amazing meme smiths. Big shout outs to our friends, Vienticus Prime in the house, Just Cause, K Bean, of course, Playing Hooky, our friend Ronnie Cole, Zulu, Beyond the Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, Janek, Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me, modding down the fort for us, along with our meme smith, Sleepy Dog Lee. Nathan, NA10, and Jigam Gigam, memeing it up, making things look nice and beautiful. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We are going to be back here tomorrow. It's going to be a Wednesday, and it's going to be busy. We're going to see what the day has in store for us. And when we're back here, we need to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.